Hello, and welcome to a special third Thursday at Hoover's Extra. I'm so glad you could join us this evening. I'm Jerry Flegel, President and CEO of the Hoover Presidential Foundation. We've been very busy here at the foundation as we prepare to launch the next phase of our major fundraising campaign for the renovation of the Hoover Presidential Library and Museum exhibit space. It's been about 30 years since the last renovation, and we're excited about bringing new technology and other updates to the museum. Of course, we'll need your help to do this. The project is called Timeless Values, Modern Experience, the campaign for the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library and Museum. The goal is to raise $20 million for the updates and to further enhance your visit experience. As a special benefit, Iowa taxpayers who contribute to the Timeless Values campaign can earn a 25% Iowa State tax credit and it's on any amount uh, of a gift of any size on that up to $1 million. You can learn more about this amazing project and the tax credit at timelessvaluescampaign.org. Of course, right after this program. So I'd like to encourage you to regularly check our website and Facebook page, as well as those of the library, historic site, and your favorite public library for our special program offerings that will pop up in the months ahead. In fact, we have online programs every month for you to enjoy. In just two weeks during our regular monthly event, Third Thursdays, author and historian Brandon Little will present Hoover, a 50-year humanitarian odyssey. The program will detail the people who helped Hoover get organized to feed millions. Registration is still open for the free program on our website or through a partner library. As for this program, we invite you to enter questions anytime during the program through the Q&A feature that you'll find along the edge of your screen. You may also vote for questions someone else has entered if you'd like to hear those answered. As we may not have time to answer all the questions provided, top vote getters will get asked first. Now tonight's presentation is called A Prairie Village, Herbert Hoover's West Branch, 1874 to 1885. It's my pleasure to welcome our own Herbert Hoover National Historic Site Ranger, Peter Hainley. His talk will provide details about Herbert Hoover's first decade of life in the Prairie Village of West Branch, Iowa, a market and railroad town that was just coming into its own during the years of his boyhood. Regular Third Thursday attendees may remember Peter's presentation last September about Herbert's father, Jesse Hoover, and the details of his life. If you missed it, you can view it on our website, on our virtual program archive under the news and events tab. It's really well done. And I highly recommend checking it out to learn more about West Branch and Herbert Hoover's history. We're glad to have Peter back with us again tonight. Peter has a doctorate degree in history from Iowa State University and his research efforts have been widely published. We don't often hear too much about Herbert's childhood. So let's welcome Peter and see what he's discovered for us tonight. Peter, thank you for joining us and welcome back to the program. Thank you, Jerry. Well, we're going to get started. Uh, I'm talking about West Branch in the years that Herbert Hoover was a little boy. In other words, the years from the time he was born up until when he uh, went uh, west to Oregon as an orphan. Herbert Hoover spent the first decade of his long and eventful life in the Prairie Village of West Branch, Iowa a market town that was just coming into its own during the years that he was a little boy. The community left an indelible impression on him in many different ways. I've chosen this topic because it's just an interesting one. It fits with our interpretation of Herbert Hoover's birthplace and childhood here at the Herbert Hoover National Historic Site. And I'm focused on the years that Hoover actually uh, lived in West Branch, so uh, approximately 11 years of his childhood. Uh, we'll start by uh, starting at the very beginning, which is with the prairie. So West Branch was covered with prairie uh, in the 1840s and 1830s, and for 10,000 years before that, in fact, at one time, over 85% of the state of Iowa was covered with tall grass prairie. And you see here a, a beautiful photograph of uh, the restored prairie uh, that's on the former uh, 
Isaac Miles Farm, which is part of the historic site today. Of course, uh, there were people here, the indigenous population of Iowa uh, Indians originally, and later on the Meskwaki. And here we have a picture of a Meskwaki woman by uh, a wiki up and uh, a painting of Powashik. We know that Powashik had some villages in the area around uh, West Branch, and of course, later gave his name or his name was uh, appropriated uh, for the county here in Iowa. Uh, the uh, native uh, people stayed in uh, the West Branch area into the early settlement era. And in fact, uh, there are early settler accounts of them hunting and fishing and gathering uh, medicinal herbs and other plants uh, in West Branch as late as the 1850s and 1860s. So, Iowa begins to open for settlement starting in 1833. Before uh, the land could be settled by European settlers, it had to be surveyed. Of course, Europeans had a very different concept of land than the uh, native peoples had. Uh, for a European settler, uh, land had to be measured and bought and owned and possessed. And in order to do that measuring, a survey team, such as you see pictured here, would go out, uh, commissioned by the government, and survey township and section lines uh, using tridents and uh, gunner's chains, uh, like you see in the photo here. A gunner's chain is uh, 66 feet long, and each link of the chain is 7.92 inches. Uh, and uh, Certain, I think it's 80 repetitions of that chain will equal a mile. And as the surveyors would uh, go along, they would uh, write notes about the uh, landscape uh, from an economic standpoint. So in other words, they were writing uh, sort of an account that uh, could be used by the government to encourage people to settle in a given area. So they describe the land, they describe trees, they describe uh, water courses and so forth. And uh, these uh, survey notes today are an invaluable record of the land before it was settled. And we actually have the notes uh, from the two surveyors uh, who surveyed uh, the present site of West Branch. The first uh, surveyor was William A. Burke, who ran the township lines for Springdale Township. And he commented, that the township is mostly high rolling prairie, second rate soil, mostly sandy loam, some groves of timber on a near south boundary and a small grove on section three. The streams have a gentle current and good water. In October of 1837, so a few months later, William Shoemaker actually surveyed sections five, six, seven, and eight of, of the township. And for those of you uh, who are familiar with West Branch, uh, sections five, six, seven, and eight uh, are, they meet uh, at exactly the corner of Downey and Main Street. So as uh, Bert is walking the lines, uh, mapping out these sections, he's actually walking right past the site of the Hoover birthplace and right down Main Street, West Branch. And he also commented that the uh, township was high rolling prairie with good soil, well watered, uh, two branches of the Wapsinonac passing through it. It may be considered one of the best prairie townships in this list as the soil and situation is well calculated for farming. There are good springs, all of limestone water, except one near the corner of section 33, which seems impregnated with iron. The township will ultimately be of great value as farming land. So, Settlement began soon after these surveys uh, were completed. In fact, uh, even a little bit before, David Walton, who's said to be the first settler in Cedar County, actually showed up in 1836. And uh, other settlers came into the area around Rochester and, and Tipton and so forth, but they didn't come into the area uh, around West Branch until the 1850s. And very uh, early on, Laurie Tatum, uh, who would one day be a, an important figure in Herbert Hoover's life, became the first Quaker settler. 
uh, in the area of, of Springdale and West Branch. Uh, and uh, funnily enough, among the very, very first settlers to come to uh, this township was the uh, family of uh, Jesse uh, and Rebecca Hoover. Here you see uh, a map. This is also my, my backdrop uh, behind me so you can't see my messy desk. This is the Spicer map of Cedar County, which dates from about 1866. Uh, and you can see uh, Springdale Township is uh, outlined in blue in the lower left. And I've done a little detail of that uh, portion of the map. Unfortunately, the scan's not clear enough. Uh, on the original map, you can actually read the names of these original settlers. The Hoovers arrived at West Branch in 1855. And up until uh, two weeks ago, uh, we believed that they had made the decision to leave for Iowa in 1854. Uh, but we have just located, or at least I just located, maybe other people knew about it, Jesse Hoover's original land uh, patent. So this is the document that you see on the right for buying uh, land here in Cedar County, Iowa. And you'll notice that it's dated 1852. So he actually owned his uh, 160 odd acres of land here in Iowa uh, a few years before they made their migration. The pictures that you see there are of members of the Hoover family. The couple uh, posed together are Jesse Hoover the first and his wife, Rebecca. Uh, the man in the middle center is Eli Hoover, who would be the president's grandfather, the son of Jesse and Rebecca. And the woman at the bottom is Hannah Leonard Hoover, who was Jesse, who, uh, excuse me, who was Eli Hoover's second wife, uh, his first wife having died uh, in Ohio. Another early family to arrive here were Theodore and Mary Wildsley Menthorne the parents of Hulda Randall Menthorne, who would become the mother of Herbert Hoover. All of these new arrivals together formed the Red Cedar Meeting, uh, a Quaker meeting uh, here in West Branch. It first met in the little 1853 schoolhouse that you see a sketch of at the left of your screen. Uh, they uh, originally had sort of a uh, a linen cloth that ran down the center of the room. If you know the meeting house that we have here in the park today, it has a partition. In the schoolhouse, uh, they would hold their meetings with a cloth down the middle to separate the men and the women during business meetings. Uh, they built that schoolhouse in 1853 at the crossroads of what are now Main and Downey Street. And that is the very first building, uh, technically speaking, in West Branch. Uh, four years later, they built the Meeting House, which of course also stands in the park, and that was in 1857. These early Quakers were uh, heavily involved in the Underground Railroad, uh, a uh, secret system by which uh, anti-slavery and abolitionists uh, would help uh, enslaved persons escape to the North and find freedom. And one of the people who assisted in that uh, Underground Railroad was Dr. Henry John Minthorne. And that is a picture of, uh, of Henry Minthorne there on the left. Uh, that's from the uh, Hoover Presidential Library. Henry Minthorne was the son of Theodore and Mary Wasley Minthorne and the older brother of Hulda Hoover. And later on, he would be the guardian of Herbert Hoover. Uh, other people involved in, in the uh, Underground Railroad included Lori Tatum, the first uh, settler, uh, Quaker settler of Springdale Township, and James Townsend. James Townsend ran an inn that was called the Traveler's Rest, and this building is also still standing in West Branch. The picture you see at the top of the screen is a uh, later picture of the Traveler's Rest. John Brown actually stayed there during one of his trips through Iowa. The lower picture is a magnificent stereo card 
uh, and those of you who are familiar with early photography, you would put this in a special viewer and look through the viewer and the two images will actually uh, merge and you'll see it as a sort of a 3D. It's like an early form of Viewmaster. Anyway, a lot of the early pictures of West Branch that I'm going to be showing you tonight are stereo cards, many of them collected by Paul Jewell of Iowa City uh, and, and uh, currently has the State Historical Society in Iowa City. Many of them were taken by the Townsend family, uh, an early uh, settler family here. James Townsend was the patriarch of that family. Uh, in this stereo card, you're actually seeing James Townsend standing in the doorway of the barn at the Traveler's Rest. And in the background is West Branch. And I've analyzed this picture a little bit under magnification. Uh, and you can actually see the steeple of the Methodist Church and the uh, front portion, I believe, of Jesse Hoover's blacksmith shop. Uh, if you if you really magnify this picture. Anyway, West Branch was developing in these years of the 1860s. Joseph Steer, pictured here, built the first store in town. Uh, and uh, in 1860, you could say that West Branch had two houses, William Oliphant's and Joseph Steer's, uh, later a, a home of uh, Samuel King, which also housed the post office. Uh, during the 1860s, building lots went on sale, and you'll see several houses built on both sides of Downey Street. There's slow and steady growth in the years of the 1860s. During these years, West Branch was on a stagecoach route, uh, and Joseph Albin, who is uh, seated on the stagecoach in this photo at left, um, was the stagecoach driver. He was only 16 years old. Uh, he and his father had the contract to deliver the mail between Davenport and Iowa City. And uh, at that time, they were going across the treeless, trackless prairie, if you will, with very few settlers. School started in West Branch in 1853 in the little frame building that we just saw. Later on, Joel and Hannah Bean, pictured here, um, Joel is on the left, of course, uh, would start what was called a select school, uh, which meant that they had a school that uh, pay, you paid a subscription to attend it. And it was at their farm, which was about a mile outside of town called the Evergreens. And on the right, you'll see uh, the attendance uh, uh, record book uh, for that select school and about two thirds of the way down, you'll see H.R. Minthorn uh, listed and that's Hulda, Hulda Hoover. She attended that school as a, uh, as a young teenager. In 1867, uh, the Quakers raised $1,500 to build a two story school building which they called the Friends Academy of West Branch. Uh, and Joel and Hannah Bean will be the first teachers. Uh, that will only last for about two years, and then uh, they will uh, start renting it uh, to the town uh, for a public school, and it becomes uh, the, the public school for West Branch. The town of West Branch really starts taking shape, what with the school and the Quaker meeting house and all these settlers coming in. In 1869, Joseph Steer will actually uh, survey and plat the town, and this is his original plat of West Branch. Uh, a little bit later, uh, some other developers will plat a town called Cameron uh, that is uh, attached uh, to modern West Branch, and there's actually a little bit of a battle that goes on uh, for naming the town, whether it'll be Cameron or West Branch. Eventually, the federal government decided the matter because they said, you've already got a post office. It's named West Branch. That's going to be the name of your town. Uh, why West Branch? Well, it's uh, located on the West Branch of the Wapsinonak Creek. Uh, it was the West Branch, if you will, of the Red Cedar Quaker meeting. But I think more importantly, a lot of the early families, including the Hoovers, have come from the West Branch Quaker meeting in Ohio and very likely transferred that name here 
uh, kind of out of homesickness or sentimentality uh, for the uh, town they had known. So West Branch in the 1860s is really a tiny little place. Uh, it's just beginning to be a little bit of a trading uh, area in the post office. And then comes the railroad. The Burlington Cedar Rapids and Northern Railway Company will actually reach West Branch uh, very late in 1870. And on January the 7th, 1871, the town will celebrate it uh, with a big basket dinner held east of the track at uh, Joseph Steers Lumber Yard. Lots of food at this event. Uh, and uh, at the time, uh, somebody makes a, a speech and says that now we're connected by rail to the great commercial cities of the East, the coal fields of the West and the lumbering mills of the Mississippi in the North. Anyway, the railroad will be the making of West Branch. And in the years after the railroad arrives, you just see an explosion of businesses uh, develop in, in the community. This is probably the single most important piece of paper in West Branch history. As far as I know, it is the only extant copy of the West Branch Business Directory of 1877. And you can see on this sheet, all of the different businesses that were located in town. In the right-hand column, about halfway uh, down, you'll see J.C. Hoover's Blacksmith and Repair uh, and advertising that he also sells pumps. You'll see Crook's Hotel, you'll see Charles Leach's Lumber Company, uh, and many other uh, businesses that were quite prominent in West Branch in those early years. They had hotels because they had the railroad. First hotel was the National Hotel, which would have stood opposite the area we call the Village Green. Uh, on Main Street, uh, where the bandstand uh, is today, the bandstand in the park that is. And this is a stereograph, uh, again, taken by uh, either Isaac or Timothy Townsend. And in 1877, you had another hotel, Crook's Hotel, which some of you will remember as the Hoover House, and which still stands on the corner of Downey and Main Street in West Branch. Now, uh, I don't know about you, but if I had a choice between staying at a place called the National Hotel or a place called Crook's Hotel, uh, I might go with the National. Uh, anyway, Crook's Hotel uh, prospered and uh, was a fixture of West Branch and still is a fixture of West Branch for, for uh, well over a century and a half. It's a wonderful uh, addition to the West Branch Historic District. You had photographers, and I, because I'm interested in early photography, I wanted to include this. Uh, again, uh, Timothy Townsend uh, was a, a member of the Townsend family of West Branch. He actually had a studio on Clinton Street in Iowa City. Um, the picture in lower right, the stereograph is uh, of Clinton Street. Uh, the photograph of the man uh, leaning on the camera is actually a picture we believe of, of uh, Timothy Townsend. And on the left, you see uh, I.L. Townsend's uh, photographer stamp. So in other words, the stamp that would have been on the back of uh, the photographs that he made. We're very fortunate that the Townsends and others were in West Branch in those years, uh, photographing uh, the people and the buildings uh, so that I'm able to make this presentation uh, of West Branch using almost exclusively uh, photos that were taken in the 1870s. The village will incorporate in 1875, and actually there's um, an election held uh, to, to, uh, to get that incorporation through, uh, and it only passes by a few votes. Uh, there were 41 votes for incorporating and 34 votes against it. This map of West Branch dates from about 1871, and you can see that the town uh, is uh, got a lot of lots plotted already, and it's and it's definitely growing. Uh, I just wanted to run through some of the different businesses 
that were here in West Branch uh, in 1880, so right about the time it incorporated. You had doctors. Uh, you had Dr. Leach, you had Dr. Bailey, you had a bank, you had general stores, Joseph Steer's store, Townsend and Miles, you had a furniture store, harness shop, lumber and coal dealers. There was a nursery, there was a barber shop, a cobbler, jeweler, carpenters, tailor shops, two of them. Uh, there, were, uh, there was a millinery shop. This was the only woman owned business in West Branch in the 1870s. And in those years, uh, it was one of the few things that a, a, a woman could operate uh, that was considered proper uh, and genteel. Uh, it was also uh, uh, not only a rare opportunity for a woman to own a business, but it was also one of the few businesses in town where it would have been uh, considered seemly for a, a woman to uh, do her own shopping. There was a bookstore there were three different drug stores, uh, hardware store. There were uh, three operating blacksmiths in West Branch, not only Jesse Hoover, uh, but Langstraff and Brund Brundage, uh, who had a partnership. And uh, as I mentioned, butcher shops, grain dealers, a livery stable, and of course, the newspaper, which started out as the index, became the West Branch Times in 1875 switched its name to the West Branch Local Record for a few years, and then became the West Branch Times again, which name it still has uh, to this day. This is an amazing photograph. This is, the it's labeled West Branch High School, but what it is showing is that building that was constructed for the village school in 1867, which later, uh, became the West Branch High School. So this is just an, an amazing photo, again, taken by the Townsends. Uh, and of course, uh, speaking of uh, women's role in the community, another job that they were able to take was a school teacher. And we always remember Molly Brown Karen, uh, who was Herbert Hoover's favorite teacher, who taught him in the fourth and fifth grade. Uh, and uh, would have been teaching him in, in a building that was adjacent uh, to this structure. That is the uh, schoolhouse that Herbert Hoover attended. Again, this picture is from about 1878. And uh, the uh, lady on the right, who looks like she's really happy-go-lucky, uh, is Molly Brown Karen, Herbert Hoover's favorite teacher, who was actually a, a, a gentle and kind uh, lady, uh, even if this picture doesn't give you that impression. These are some of the early homes in West Branch. Uh, the top slide is of uh, uh, Benjamin uh, Miles's house. We don't know who lived in the brick house at lower left, um, but it is identified as being in West Branch. The house on the uh, right the black and white photograph is the James Staples House, which is now part of the Herbert Hoover National Historic Site. All of these pictures are contemporary. So again, because of those early photographers were able to do this presentation using pictures that were taken 150 years ago, not just uh, pictures of old buildings. Uh, this picture is another one that uh, Paul Jewell collected, <coughs> and it is one of the early churches of West Branch. Now, of course, West Branch was predominantly Quaker uh, in those years, uh, but there were also Methodists. And this is the Methodist church. It was built in 1871, and the Presbyterians will build a church in 1877. Those were the churches that were here when Hoover was a boy. The Lutheran church will come after he had moved to Oregon. Uh, this picture of the Methodist Church is uh, really neat because, uh, wow, it, it's on Downey Street. And uh, if the photographer had taken this picture a few steps to the left or had faced his camera the opposite direction, in other words, facing uh, uh, at the church from the other side, he would have photographed Jesse Hoover's blacksmith shop when Jesse Hoover owned it. 
Uh, so we come very close here to having a picture of, of the Hoover blacksmith shop. Uh, what is uh, interesting in this picture is behind the Methodist church, you can see the building just to the right of the structure. Uh, that is the West Branch Industrial School, which we'll talk about in the next slide. Uh, in the 1870s, of course, there was great concern on the part of President Grant uh, about uh, the way Native Americans were being treated uh, and about corrupt uh, agents. Uh, and he initiated what he called his peace policy uh, in which he appointed uh, religious uh, missionary type people to serve as uh, agents to the different Native American tribes. And one of the most prominent of these uh, agents was Lori Tatum, who is uh, seated, the uh, gentleman in the middle of this photo, uh, with some Kiowa uh, children uh, that he worked with as an agent to the Kiowa tribe. And of course, uh, Lori Tatum was the first Quaker settler of uh, Springdale and uh, later Herbert Hoover's guardian. Uh, other agents from West Branch included Laban Miles, who would be an agent uh, for the Osage uh, in what is now Oklahoma, and he was Herbert Hoover's uncle. Laban and Agnes Minthorn Miles. Agnes Miles is pictured at left. She was Hulda Hoover's little sister. Laban Miles is the gentleman in the picture at right with the mustache. He will be an agent for the Osage tribe uh, for about 10 years in the 1870s and 1880s, uh, but he will continue to live in Pahuska, Oklahoma uh, the rest of his life, and he will be an advocate uh, for the Osage people uh, for uh, almost 50 years. And he, of course, is Herbert Hoover's uncle, and uh, of course, uh, he has an impact on uh, his nephew's attitude towards uh, native people. Anyway, he also plays a role in the West Branch Industrial School because part of the peace policy was to establish boarding schools in the north. And you may have heard something about this in the last year. The Park Service is currently undertaking an effort to document these schools. The most famous one was at Carlisle, uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, for these schools, uh, children were taken uh, from their parents, uh, brought north uh, to boarding schools as much as a thousand uh, miles away from home, completely separated from their culture, forced to uh, speak English uh, and to adopt uh, European, uh, European uh, ways. And this was a disaster. Many of these children died uh, because they were kept in close quarters and they were exposed to uh, cold northern weather conditions and uh, European diseases that they had no natural resistance for. Uh, and uh, when they would return, if they survived, um, they were often outcasts uh, in their own tribal communities because they were no longer fully the native culture and no longer, uh, but also not really uh, part of the European culture. Uh, unfortunately, West Branch plays a role in this. Laban Miles' father, Benjamin Miles, uh, learned that it was possible to obtain funding from the Bureau of Indian Affairs to manage a school uh, in, in Iowa. And so he started the West Branch Industrial School. All told, about 35 Native children, uh, mostly Osage, but also including some Sauk in Iowa, uh, will come here. Uh, from principally Kansas and what's now Oklahoma uh, during the year 1883. And the, uh, while they're here, they are uh, taught industrial arts. Uh, they work on the Isaac Miles farm and learn farming techniques, uh, or I should say European farming techniques. Uh, the girls learn household tasks and they are given uh, rudimentary education and, and reading, writing, arithmetic, and so forth. Uh, at the end of 1883, the school will relocate to Lee County, Iowa, 
uh, where it will be until 1887 when its main building burns down and it is, uh, it is disbanded. Uh, what we have here on the left is a picture of the industrial school uh, as it looked in later years uh, when, it, when it had been moved to uh, Main Street and West Branch. The other photograph is an absolutely incredible image uh, that uh, is in the collection of the uh, Hoover Presidential Library. And it actually shows the students of the industrial school in 1883 here in West Branch. Um, we know that two of the children may be included in this photo, but we know that two of the children died uh, during the period that the school operated and they are um, buried in a um, unmarked graves in the West Branch Cemetery in the Quaker section. Uh, and uh, so it, it's, it's, a, it's a sad story. One slightly positive note is that uh, the Hoover boys, Tad and Bert, the future president, uh, played with uh, three of the boys uh, from the school and Herbert Hoover would always recall that relationship very fondly all his life. So who are the people of West Branch at this time? Who are the people that have the industrial school and who have all of these shops and businesses? Well, we did some number crunching. We looked at the 1880 census. West Branch had a population of 502 people, which is, which is great for me to find out because I've been telling visitors for three years now that there were about 500 people here when Hoover was a boy and I found out I was actually right. Uh, so there were 502 people, 267 women, 225 men, 111 families. Uh, I actually went through the census based on where these people had come from, where uh, they had been born. And a huge proportion of them, 26%, were from Ohio. 40%, uh, almost all of them children, uh, were born in Iowa, 6% in Pennsylvania. And you can see on the slide here that there were people from Indiana, Illinois, Maine, New York, New Jersey, Virginia, Vermont, New Hampshire, Kansas, Maryland, Massachusetts, Minnesota, Wisconsin, North Carolina, and Connecticut. Uh, you'll notice that almost all of those uh, places of birth are in the Northeast. And so that means that uh, as we would have expected, the people who settled West Branch and indeed much of Iowa were following what we call straight line migration, which just basically means they moved in a straight line. They started in New England, they probably moved to Ohio or Indiana, maybe to Illinois, moved on to Iowa, Either in the case of some of these families, like the Hoovers, uh, they continued moving on farther west. Uh, Her President Hoover's family will eventually wind up in central and in western Iowa and in Oregon, uh, as did many other families that were here in West Branch in these years. There weren't a lot of non-native born people living in West Branch. Seven folks were born in England, five in Denmark. That number would go up uh, quite a bit in, in the next 20 years. There would actually be a Danish Lutheran church here. Uh, you can see the numbers, four from Canada, three from Ireland, two from Switzerland, uh, and so on. Uh, there is one African-American resident of West Branch in 1880, uh, a man named Henry Austin, uh, who was a uh, mail clerk, and he was born in North Carolina. Beyond that, uh, the population is amazingly uh, homogeneous. In fact, uh, not only were they all uh, European descent and mostly from the Northeast, but they were probably all Republican. Herbert Hoover used to tell people that the only uh, Democrat that he remembered in West Branch was also the town drunk. And so he served as a, uh, a useful moral example to the children. Uh, we know that there were basically two families of uh, folks who were Democrats, the Mackeys and the Butlers, uh, here in West Branch in those years. Uh, and again, so many of the population uh, was predominantly Quaker. Unfortunately, I don't have uh, a listing of the Quaker membership in those years so that I can compare it with the census and actually uh, tell you exactly what the percentage is. Uh, 
why to focus on a few of the people, uh, tell some of the personal stories. This is Dr. William Walker, uh, who is a friend of the Hoover family. He was actually their dentist. Uh, he began practicing in West Branch in 1871. He had an office above the bank. And uh, like dentists today, he knew that it was not always the most pleasant thing in the world to go to have your teeth worked on. So he filled his office with house plants and singing canaries and interesting stuff like uh, shark's teeth and um, minerals and rocks and, and fossils. In fact, he was an amateur geologist and he remembered the little boy, uh, Bertie Hoover coming up and standing there and looking at the rocks and talking rocks with him. And he always believed that he had had an impact on Herbert Hoover's later decision to become a geologist. Um, I just love Dr. Walker because if he had an especially uh, difficult case, uh, he would tell the paper about it. And you just have to love a small town paper in these years because they printed everything. Uh, not only who, who had found the, uh, the egg uh, with three yolks in it and who raised the first peaches in town, uh, but the day that Dr. Walker extracted 25 teeth from Mrs. Joseph Coombs, some of them being nearly sound. She endured the operation without the application of any anesthetic agents, the paper noted, and almost without flinching. That's not the only time that they reported on one of his cases like that. Uh, Dr. Walker will live a long time. He dies in 1928, just when Herbert Hoover was running for president. He actually left his geology collection to Herbert Hoover uh, and the story in the paper at that time was that President Hoover gave it to the high school. We think that they still have a few of these uh, geological samples, but there's no way of knowing for sure. We did track down some uh, early uh, 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 mounted uh, specimens in, in the high school collection here in town to this day. Uh, another family I don't have a picture of were the Forneys. Uh, they were the uh, family of the town ta uh, Taylor, Levi. They came from Ohio, which is very, very typical for folks in West Branch. Uh, and they took great pride in their yard. And I uh, just have to mention in the paper, uh, again, they printed everything. Uh, th this notice and passing the residence of Mr. Levi Forney the other day, we were attracted into the yard by the beautiful display of flowers that decked the mounds and walks and on closer inspection, we discovered that everything on the premises, both inside the house and out were regulated by the same good order and taste. And the Forneys were the Hoovers across the street neighbors. So if you know the Hoover birthplace cottage, that empty grassy area in front of it is where their house was. There was Nathan Crook. Nathan Crook who came to town with $40 in his pocket to take a job pumping water for the railroad, uh, eventually opened a barber shop and a restaurant and Crook's Hotel and later owned a lot of real estate here in town and was one of the town's leading citizens. And there's Eli Hoover uh, pictured here, Herbert Hoover's uh, very interesting grandfather who was an inventor who invented the cattle pump that you see pictured on this slide, uh, which was a self-operating cattle pump the cow would stand on the platform uh, and that would actually activate the pump and, and get it a drink of water. There were Jesse and Hulda Hoover, the president's parents who are absolutely typical of West Branch residents. Hulda came from Ontario, Canada. Jesse came from Ohio. Uh, there you see their marriage license. And without going into too much detail about their, their lives, of course, Hulda was very active in the local Quaker meeting. Uh, she was active in the local temperance society uh, and in a uh, sort of a youth club that they had here in West Branch. Jesse uh, was, <clears throat> Jesse was the town blacksmith. They of course had three children. They had uh, Theodore, Herbert, 
funnily enough, I almost forgot him. And Mary. Uh, here we, oh, here we have Jesse Hoover's blacksmith shop. Uh, th this is a detail of the uh, ad I showed you in the big business directory a little while ago. The sketch in the lower right is uh, a sketch of uh, the blacksmith shop as it was in about 1880 as remembered by uh, Theodore Hoover, who was the president's older brother. And here we have little Birdie. And I love these pictures. These are uh, tin types. Uh, tin types were very popular in the 1860s and 1870s. Uh, basically, they were uh, pieces of coated iron uh, painted with uh, uh, photographic emulsion and uh, exposed, uh, and they were very cheap to make. And the Townsend family made a lot of tin types. So we have pictures of many people from West Branch in those years, including nine month old Bert, Bertie Hoover there on the left, and another picture of him when he was only three years old. And uh, these are photographs of, from the original tin types. You've probably seen these images before. I wanted to include this because part of our research into early West Branch has been to um, hopefully solve a mystery uh, and to explode a myth. Uh, some of the material uh, that we've been telling folks for years is that the Hoovers uh, sold the birthplace cottage in 1878 and then they moved uh, in 1879 to the House of the Maples and we call that their second house. But actually, Tad Hoover remembered that they lived in a rented house in between, and he described exactly where that house was in West Branch. Without going into too much detail, this is a circa 1970 photograph of what I think was the Hoover's second house. Uh, and it stood uh, near um, the present post office, and unfortunately, it is no longer standing. Uh, so the Hoovers actually lived in three different places while they were here in West Branch. And I, I do want to add all three of them were located within the boundaries of the uh, Hoover presidential, uh, uh, excuse me, the, remember where I work, uh, the Herbert Hoover National Historic Site. This is another awesome early photograph uh, and it is of what the Hoovers called the House of the Maples. This is their third house, uh, the house that Jesse Hoover bought in 1879. Uh, it's the house that Herbert Hoover actually remembered from his childhood. Uh, it is uh, the house, unfortunately, where both of his parents passed away. What makes this picture especially uh, impressive is the woman standing in front of the house is actually Hulda Hoover. Uh, so that's Herbert Hoover's mother. That means that this picture had to have been taken uh, in about 1883 because she died in 1884 in February. Jesse Hoover will be an active businessman in the West Branch community. And those of you who uh, sat through my presentation on Jesse Hoover uh, last uh, fall will remember these ads. Uh, he used a little humor in his advertisements in the local paper. One of the things that he made in his shop was barbed wire. Uh, and we just literally uh, two weeks ago located a photograph of a reel of barbed wire that a local uh, family had that supposedly was made by Jesse Hoover. And that's on this slide. Uh, and he would coat this wire with tar. And some of you may remember uh, that uh, the future president uh, decided to experiment with his father's tar kettle. This kettle outside the uh, farm implement store uh, where he was heating the tar and Bertie wondered what would happen if he threw a burning stick into the uh, uh, tar kettle, which uh, of course meant that there was these flames and smoke and you can read about it here in the paper. At the time that this uh, appeared in the paper, which is at the very end of 1879, uh, it, it 
uh, alleged that uh, uh, it was supposed that uh, it, had, it had just overheated. Actually, nobody knew that uh, Bert had started the fire until some 40 years later when he finally confessed. And of course, it became one of these stories that he loved to tell. Uh, other stories that he loved to tell uh, were about all the amusements that they had as kids growing up here in West Branch. Uh, they, they lived in this little village at the base of Cook's Hill, uh, and they had very simple pleasures. Uh, before I talk about those pleasures, though, I want you to look at this picture. This is, again, a stereograph uh, taken by the Townsend family in 1878. Now, there's a reason why uh, these pictures are preserved, why we have them today. Uh, it's almost accidental. Agnes Minthorn um, Miles was living in Indian territory and she was terribly homesick. So one of her relations here in West Branch, according to tradition, either asked Timothy Townsend to take these pictures uh, or uh, just bought, uh, bought photographs that Townsend had made of West Branch and sent them to Agnes who treasured them uh, and later her family gave them to the presidential library. If you were to zoom in on this, uh, on this view, you would actually see the uh, gable of the Hoover Birthplace Cottage. This is exactly the view that we have today as we come in every morning from Interstate 80, uh, driving by the BP gas station, headed down Cooks Hill into, uh, into West Branch in the park. This is another, about 1880, uh, picture that shows uh, shops in West Branch. <coughs> Excuse me. This is Main Street, uh, looking from about Downey uh, towards Green, in other words, looking east. Uh, in those years, there were many simple amusements that children like Bert Hoover would be involved in. These included the fair, which in those years meant um, the, uh, actually the fair in West Liberty. Uh, they would run special trains uh, for people to go to uh, the Muscatine County Fair in West Liberty, which is held on the same site uh, 150 years later. And the Hoover boys actually remembered this. Uh, Tad Hoover, the older brother, will write about uh, going to the fair with his, his parents, talking about the horse races, which it was not proper to see and were known of only by rumor. Uh, and uh, the, the hall where the household exhibit was to be seen, quilts and fancy work, pies, cakes, et cetera, which interested my mother immensely. Uh, so that was one amusement. Another was fishing. And of course, we all know Herbert Hoover loved to fish. Uh, and uh, in his memoirs, he wrote of sunfish and catfish. Uh, he talked about um, the uh, butcher string lines uh, that, and uh, hooks that he would buy for 10 for a dime uh, for fishing. Uh, and that would have been in the Wapsie Nonac Creek. Uh, they also had uh, dammed uh, the creek down um, about a block and a half from the park and created a swimming hole. You can still kind of see where the swimming hole was in the Hoover Boys Day. Uh, other things that families did were go on a lot of picnics. The Hoovers would uh, both remember going on picnics uh, uh, with their parents. Uh, and they would also remember the 4th of July, which was just an amazing social event in those years. Uh, that would usually start early in the morning when the town blacksmith would fire off gunpowder under his anvil and make an enormous clanging noise. Uh, and of course, there were fireworks and so on. And people in West Branch would usually go to a place near town called The Grove uh, to celebrate Independence Day. Finally, there were organizational meetings. Uh, you know, there was the Temperance Society. It may not sound like a fun group, of people to meet with, but certainly um, that got reported in the local paper as, as something that people did, uh, probably for fun, you know, it was contact. 
you visited people. All of these houses have porches on the front because in those years, uh, you would sit out on the porch on a Sunday afternoon and uh, talk to your neighbors as they walked by. Uh, and there was just a lot of more socializing. And for the Hoover, uh, for the Hoover relatives, uh, the Hoover house, tiny though it was, was kind of the center of all of this activity. They all remembered in later years how Jesse and Hulda uh, were very hospitable and how they would just go to uh, their house and, and uh, visit and spend time. There were gatherings of family members. This happens to be the Townsend family uh, gathering in 1878. And of course, the Hoover family uh, was photographed at a gathering in 1879. Um, it's difficult without a laser pointer to show you where President Hoover is in here. But if you look at the very, very back row, you'll see a little boy in the tree. That's Theodore Hoover, his older brother. There we go. And just to the left, you'll see uh, the head of Jesse Hoover and the little boy he's holding, who is Bert Hoover, the future president. There were family gatherings like that. And it seems to have been idyllic. Uh, you know, in our uh, uh, film here at the park, we talk about uh, Hoover wished for everyone a childhood such as he had had in West Branch, and certainly he had extremely fond memories uh, of, of that childhood. Unfortunately, uh, dark clouds came into the picture. Uh, the Quakers had a terrible split. Uh, an evangelist from Ohio named David Updegraff there's his uh, picture on the right, uh, would come. Uh, he had a more evangelical view of the Quaker faith. Uh, he had some different doctrinal ideas. Uh, among other things, uh, uh, there will be a split between the evangelical Quakers and the more conservative friends. Uh, the evangelical Quakers will keep the meeting house. They'll introduce a minister. They'll have music. Uh, in sermons and so on. And the Hoover family will stay with the evangelical Hoovers uh, while uh, other Quakers will maintain the silent Quaker worship uh, that they'd always had. And here you see Joel and Hannah Bean in their later years. And Joel and Hannah Bean will actually side with the uh, conservative Quakers uh, and uh, will be so utterly distraught by what happened with this split, you know, it was literally families um, not speaking, uh, being on speaking terms with one another. Uh, they'll move to California uh, and several other families will leave West Branch uh, at about this time. And this is in 1883, 1884, uh, just about the time uh, that uh, uh, Herbert Hoover is orphaned. So this is the what I mean by the out migration. These are uh, a lot of people moved for some reason to Pasadena, California, from West Branch. Uh, the Beans will uh, will be in that in that out migration. The Hoovers will be part of it. So a lot of those early families that uh, showed up in the 1880 census, for one reason or the other, will uh, leave West Branch and head farther west. And of course, Jesse and Hulda Hoover will both pass away. These are photographs of the Hoovers taken uh, in about 1879. Uh, Jesse, of course, here with the uh, magnificent uh, beard. Uh, and you can see their obituaries uh, on this slide. And of course, with uh, the death of Jesse and Hulda Hoover, uh, the Hoover children are all orphaned and uh, no one in the family, uh, extended family, can afford to take in all of the children. Uh, so they're parceled out. And Bert Hoover will, event, will go first to live with his Aunt Millie uh, and Uncle Alan on a farm just north of West Branch. Uh, and he'll be there for about a year. And then a letter will come from his uncle Henry John Minthorne in Oregon saying, I would like to have Bert. 
and the family will decide that yes, indeed, this would be a good move for young Bert Hoover to go west to Oregon, live with Uncle John, attend the Quaker uh, Academy that he uh, was in charge of. And so on November 10th, 1885, we actually know the exact day Herbert Hoover leaves West Branch. We know that because they put everything in the paper, like I said before, on November 12th, it mentioned that Mr. and Mrs. O.T. Hamill and Bertie Hoover started on their long journey Tuesday evening. And Tuesday evening was November 10th, 1885. Now, Bert Hoover will remember taking uh, about a dime, two dimes worth of spending money, uh, his best suit of clothes, uh, two uh, framed mottos that had hung in his family home, uh, in all of his possessions in a single suitcase. But what, el what else does he take with him from West Branch? Well, he takes uh, with him several of the values uh, that we have covered uh, in talking about West Branch in the 1870s and 1880s in this presentation. Uh, first of all, he takes uh, the value of education. We talked about how important education was. He takes away uh, a, a sense of spirituality and faith that he keeps his whole life. He takes away the importance of, the, of community and of helping each other out. And he takes away a sense of entrepreneurialism exemplified by his father and all those other people who started businesses in West Branch in those years. Um, but uh, one thing he doesn't take away uh, is again, we say here, his heart uh, always remained in West Branch. And of course, this is where he chose to put his presidential library and where he chose uh, to find his final resting place. And I apologize for going a little over long here. Uh, thank you all very much. And I guess we'll open the questions. Well, uh, Peter, thank you so much. Boy, that was just that was, that was just great information on there. And I'm sure we'll probably have a lot of questions. I've got several myself, but uh, I'll go ahead and maybe open up with just uh, one or two and we'll see if we got some others chime in. One question I had was on the location of uh, Traveler's Rest on there. Is, mm -hmm. Was it originally in where it is located now up on uh, East Main Street or was it in a different location? It was, uh, mo it was moved. Okay. I can't tell you exactly where from where it was. It was located on the east side of town and then it was moved to where it is today. Okay. Okay. Very good. Very good. Um, and then the other I was going to ask too is, um, yeah, it showed a picture of West Branch High School framed, so forth like that. Uh, where was the school located at when that picture was taken? If you know West Branch today, it's North Downey Street, right where the library is. Okay, okay, the very good. West Branch Library is exactly on the site of the school. Okay, okay, very good, very good. Well, I've got a couple, let's see here in chat. Let's see if uh, we can pull anything up there. Um, let's see here, chat. Okay. Um, well, just a lot of, a lot of big thank yous on that, um, on that, Peter. What, what other question I had is in your research, um, as far as like the naming of streets in West Branch, um, I, I, I find it interesting that, you know, we have green, orange streets, so forth like that. Uh, was, did you find any uh, rhyme or reason maybe why they did colors and compared, because there are some that I think are named after some settlers, but not many. It's, it's unusual. I don't know why they did colors. Downey, of course, is because it's the road to Downey. Uh -huh. uh, Weatherall. Uh, is because of uh, Joseph Weatherall, who was an early settler. But other than that, I don't really, I haven't really gotten into it yet. Okay, well, very good, very good. Well, well I'll tell you, we're, and we're running a little over, and I, I so much appreciate uh, Sorry. Uh, you, you coming on and doing this. This has just been terrific. And uh, as I said, we've had you here, uh, this I think is our third time, and we're going to have you back many, many more times. You just do a terrific job. And, and for anybody that uh, gets a chance to visit the park, I would sure make uh, I get a chance to uh, stop in. Um, the National Park Service has just some terrific rangers here in West Branch right now that are very knowledgeable about uh, Herbert Hoover and uh, West Branch. And, and uh, if they came from other places, they can really share their knowledge too, as uh, uh, Peter has previously. So again, that's all the time we have for questions now. Uh, I'd like to thank again, Peter, uh, for joining us tonight and for such a great presentation. 
I'd also like to thank the Herbert Hoover National Historic Site and all of the public libraries who make tonight's program a success. And I'd encourage you all to come visit the Hoover campus and enjoy a walk around the park and explore the historic buildings as the temperatures begin to warm and the leaves and flowers begin to sprout in the coming weeks on there. The Presidential Library is now open seven days a week from nine to five for your enjoyment. I'd invite you to come and see the new temporary exhibit called Hoover Heads, featuring original artwork from numerous amateur and professional artists and their attempts at capturing the likenesses of Herbert Hoover. The exhibit closes May 1st, so come and see it soon. The National Historic Site and the Historic Buildings and the Visitor Center are open daily for you to uh, enjoy and explore as well. And of course, don't forget to join us on Thursday, April 21st at 6 p.m. for another great program. It's called Hoover, a 50-year humanitarian odyssey, and will be presented by author and historian Brandon Little. You can still register for this program on our website at Hoover Presidential Foundation. Dot org. It's a free event and you should register even if you can't attend as we can send you a link to the recording of that program for you to enjoy when you're able to. The Hoover Presidential Foundation staff is ready to assist you with your membership needs or charitable gifts in support of the Hoover campus and museum renovation. And you can learn more about that and even show your support at timelessvaluescampaign.org. On behalf of all of us here at the Hoover campus and the participating public libraries, we'd like to thank you for joining us and look forward to your next visit at, to the Hoover campus. Have a wonderful evening.